started so we can so how's everybody doing we had a great uh a great joint meeting today um so um unfortunately where where is he he's not in here uh you know i was about to talk about maybe i can jump over is he outside yeah I was starting off with that. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk good about him in his presence. Give me a second. We're waiting on Cameron Jackson real quick. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, he does. Uh, or, or, or that guy by you. I don't have a seersucker, so I had to. I had to set. I don't have a seersucker or a bow tie. There he is. There he is. There he is. I, I want to speak well in your presence, man. So uh, today marks the end of our student members' service to the Board of Regents. Regent Jackson graduated from Grambling State University with a degree in computer science, mathematics, and physics. He's one of them smart folks. Physics with a biology minor. His long-term goals are to move in the health and higher education administration, but as of now, he's accepting a role as a software engineer and relocating to Dallas, Texas later this summer. Um, we can give him a hand on that, guys. Um, I will turn the mic over to you, Cameron, so you can take a moment to let us know what's ahead for you uh, as you enter the next exciting chapter, man. So appreciate your service. and. The floor is yours. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, Chair Temple, you're a boss, man. Like, you're really a boss. Like, it's been a joy being under you. Um, and former Chair of you, yeah, I've enjoyed you too. Uh, coming in, <laughs> Commissioner Reed, uh, boss lady on deck. Um, I love you. I really do. Genuinely, even when I was in the Governor's Fellows Program, like, she made sure that I was in, getting active and stuff. So last summer was definitely one where I was able to see that intersection between the Governor's Fellows and this program here. Um, my time here, even though it's come to, I thought the last meeting we had was my last time, but now seeing that this is the official last time is really bittersweet because it's like, um, since I graduated, I was able to really take some time to really focus in on, like, what's next? Like, what do you want to do? So I know I had told, um, I wanted to move into higher education, of course, healthcare administration, but this software engineering thing, and I know y'all hear me talk a lot about purpose and what's for you is for you. So I've been focusing on this whole idea of like moving where the next option lays at. So I'm curious to know like what all can I learn from a software engineering setting? Um, I told them I do not want to be behind the desk all day. Like y'all need to put me out in the open and let me go explore kind of thing. So they was like, well, well, we'll agree to that. So I'll be relocating to Dallas, Texas. Um, I actually leave July 29th, and then I start work August 6th. So um, the rest of the summer will be used to, I guess, focus in on my je ne sais quoi, like my, my area, like where am I wow. in life? I don't know if so, I can even say that. <laughs> so I'm going uh, to um, focus on in up there, um, really build myself, and really continue to walk with purpose because I'm excited about that. So um, thank you to all the board members for really investing in me, being mentors. Thank you for the, the relentless experience that I will have. Thank you for everything. Um, and I genuinely love each and every one of you. So um, I guess this is really it. <laughs> well, we have a, uh, a token. First of all, we appreciate your service to the state. We also have a token uh, that we would like to present to you. Uh, and you can use it once again the next chapter of uh, your career. So, congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. State of Louisiana, who now has become the head of the commission of the commissioner of uh, the Gulf Coast. Right? Right. Um, I got the opportunity to introduce her at the Jan and Penny. Uh, Kiki Barber. Barnes. Baker Barnes. Barnes. Right. Uh, obviously, I had that introduction right away. <laughs> 
Member of the student union. While she's signing her oath, Katerina is a Delgado Community College student. She's SGA uh, student body president there, pursuing a degree in business administration. Plans to transfer to a four-year institution to earn a degree in economics. Uh, and we're so excited to have her with us. Not the same height. <laughs> Thank you. So as we jump into it, you all, um, welcome to the Board of Regents. We look forward to serving with you and uh, very excited, of course, about us getting rolling. So um, Regent Lobray, 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 I said it right the first time, Lobray, um, is assigned to the following committees, you all, academic and student affairs, of course, uh, facilities and property. Uh, legislative and statewide programs. So she'll participate in those um, committees. And um, we know you'll have a full report at our next meeting. Uh, but if you'd like to make any brief comments right now, we'd love to hear. It looks like you're ready. Go ahead. Yeah, just to push where it says push. Bam, there you go. We're good. <laughs> Cool. All right. <laughs> um, so I guess I just want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I want to say that I'm really honored to be here. Uh, the saying, you know, always make sure that you're like the dumbest person in the room. I know I'm not dumb, but I really look forward to like learning from all of you, your experiences and things like that. I know I don't really come from a traditional educational background. When I was 18, I moved out of my house, uh, paid all my own bills, moved to Houston, Texas and got a certificate in auto body repair at UTI in Houston, Texas. Um, I worked at some dealerships and performance shops for a while. Uh, when COVID hit, I decided that it was time for a career change. My uncle had passed away a year before that, before COVID, and I was like, man, let me get close to my family and finish school. I had realized I was still hungry for knowledge and I had reached like a pay ceiling. Um, they wouldn't let me move up in several different jobs just because I didn't have a bachelor's degree. Um, I'm sure we've all had jobs before where they cap you out somewhere. So I was like, okay, let me go back and let me, if I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back. So I decided to put in all my effort towards extracurriculars and I happened to find student government because I just wanted to get back to my community. I'm really big on like just helping people who helped me. You know, I know I wouldn't have got here at all if it wasn't for people giving me advice or just, you know, taking the time to explain something to me. And so I really appreciate all that. And I just want to kind of give it back to the community and that's it. That is, that is more than just it. That is a great story, and it's definitely 
uh, something that's going to make a huge difference for us. And we're looking forward to your insight, uh, you know, this next year that you spend with us. So, um, <clears throat> um, and, and just to add on, add to that, uh, it's great to meet you. Welcome. And I told you this right before. I was so happy to hear you talk today because you are a regent. We want you and you have more perspective for students and what y'all are going through than we can have. It's been a long time since I've been in school. So we want you to be really active. We want to hear your voice on any issue. So don't ever feel like, well, I'm just feeling this out. You're only here for a year. So we want to hear from you right away. Perfect. Yep. You better just jump in. Great, great point, Regent David. So uh, remember, guys, we're being streamed live. So do your best to turn on your microphones and uh, speak into the mic. Uh, first up, Finance Committee. Regent Solomon, please call your committee to order, sir. All right. Thank you, Chair Temple. I'd like to call the Finance Committee to order. Uh, Matthew, will you please call the roll? All right. Yes, sir, Regent Solomon. Uh, let's see. Regent Solomon? Here. Regent Levy? Uh, Regent David? Here. Regent May? Regent Perez? Uh, Regent Seal? Here. Regent Williams Brown? Here. LCTC system representative? Present. LSU system representative? SU system representative? UL system representative. Here. We have a quorum. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we're going to now move to item number three, the review and approval of the fiscal year 22-23 operating budget distribution. Ms. Elizabeth Bentley-Smith is going to handle this item for finance. So, Elizabeth, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Regents. Uh, I wanted to discuss our very exciting budget. Uh, this legislative session Higher education received a total of $195.1 million in state funds, which includes an additional $35.9 million in supplemental funding for the current year and a $159.2 million increase for fiscal year 2023. I feel like I should pause for clap. <laughs> <clears throat> Our TOPS and Foster Scholars programs are both fully funded, and Go Grants, our need-based financial aid program, received its greatest enhancement since it was first established. So with this funding, I'm very happy to report that this year was our largest increase ever. I feel like we should clap again for, for that. <laughs> <clears throat> For current year, we were appropriated an additional $35.9 million in state funds. These supplemental dollars are from excess state funds and are considered bona fide obligations that can be used through June 2023. As shown, each system received an increase in one-time funding. LSU received $27.7 million. Southern University system received $2.5 million. The University of Louisiana system received about $17.7 million and our community college and technical system received $1.35 million. These one-time monies across all four systems include $21 million for computer and technology upgrades, $9 million for hurricane recovery and stabilization programs, and $5 million for research initiatives. Additionally, I once again want to note that TOPS remains fully funded for the current year. The negative is simply a procedural action due to adjustments made during the legislative session. For next year, higher education received a total increase in state funds of $159.2 million, of which $84.9 million is state general fund and includes $31.7 million for our faculty to receive pay increases moving them to the SREB average. $18 million in mandated costs, $15 million for all of our formula institutions, $5 million for our Title IX programming across all systems and the Board of Regents, $1 million for STEM initiatives, and an unprecedented increase for our Go Grants program of $15 million. Our specialized institutions received an increase of $23.5 million, including $6.2 million for Pennington, 
$7.1 million for the LSU Ag Center, $7.7 million for our two health sciences centers, $1.6 million for Southern University's Ag Center, and $1 million for Southern's Law Center. Further, LSU received $5.4 million for faculty recruitment, defense cybersecurity programs, and additional research funding. The University of Louisiana system received support for a dental program study at La Tech, and a security study at Grambling, totaling $2.8 million. And the Southern University system received $2.5 million in funding for operating expenses and online programs. I also want to add that higher education received $74.3 million in statutory dedications to support our Reboot Your Career 2.0, broadband training and healthcare workforce programs, initiatives related to reaching our master plan goals, and our new Foster Scholar program. Once again, the noted top swap is simply a procedural action and TOPS remains fully supported for next year. So with that, I am very happy to present the fiscal year 2023 total operating budget for Louisiana's public higher education is almost $3.3 billion with an increase of 57.5% in state funds from the previous year. Again, I feel like we should clap <laughs> for that large amount. <clears throat> With that, senior staff recommends that the committee approve the funding recommendations for higher education for fiscal year 2022-2023. And additionally, staff is requesting permission to make any adjustments among institutions within the systems as permitted by law. I also want to note that our next steps will include approving the four systems budget expenditures, as well as those of the Board of Regents, LASFA, LUMCON, at our meeting in September. And further, I want to thank all persons involved in this monumental endeavor, including the governor and the legislature, all of our board members, our system and institutional leadership, and my colleagues at the Board of Regents. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there a motion to approve this item? I see Regent Levy. I hear a second. Regent David, any discussion? And yes, sir. Regent Seal. At the beginning of 2008, uh, Louisiana was at 103% of the SREB average for faculty pay. And uh, thereafter, uh, faculty pay fell off the cliff until um, a few years ago when it began to be rebuilt. And now um, I understand we are back at the SREB average. Um, I, I just would like to hear the commissioner's thoughts on what is the significance of that for, uh, for how higher education is doing and what our future is like uh, with, in terms of salary recruitment and, and keeping, uh, keeping the good people we have with us. Thank you so much, uh, Regent Seal. First of all, huge team effort, uh, historic uh, funding, uh, the faculty pay increase we received this year is the, the sort of second piece. Last year, 19 million. This year, 31 uh, plus million dollars. Uh, we uh, expect we will be at the SREB average. That data, I think Matthew lags two years. Uh, and so this is a running target, and there's a huge talent war. And so we want to continue uh, to make sure we are addressing this issue. As you all know, you can't develop talent if you don't have great faculty and great researchers who are doing this work. Uh, so it is significant that the legislature and governor has once again uh, supported faculty pay. Uh, it is even more significant that the governor vetoed, uh, used his veto pen to restore full funding of faculty pay for all of the systems. Um, and so uh, I'm certainly thankful to uh, everyone who worked hard to make sure that um, that veto was sustained. Um, but yes, it's, it is absolutely critical for us. Uh, staff have done an amazing job as well, and so campuses are looking to see if within this 
uh, budget, they can support staff. Uh, we were not able to, we continue to ask for staff increases, but the faculty increases, teacher pay, support worker pay, those things have resonated with the legislature and the governor, and this is very significant for us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Regent Seal. Yes, Regent Levy. Can you tell me how much of the new funding will be uh, attributed to the formula? So 15 million in new funding is, is directly for the formula. Mm -hmm. So I believe overall we're at 12% increase. Is that right, Matthew? That's correct. 12% increase in state funds year over year. Yes. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, motion passes. Next up is item number four, board member travel approval. Matthew, I think you're presenting this item for us. Yes, sir. Thank you, Regent Solomon. This is uh, board member travel approval. So currently, all board members uh, follow state travel policy, which is PPM 49. This allows for elected officials, board members, and state officers to be reimbursed on actual expenses basis. These expenses include mileage, meals, and lodging. Currently, Board of Regents members receive actual mileage and reimbursement for at state rates for meals and lodging. Uh, coming before you today is a one-time request, one-time action at the request of state travel for um, current and future board members. And so with that, uh, senior staff recommends that the committee authorize Board of Regents members to receive actual travel re reimbursement in accordance with state travel guidelines. Thank you, Matthew. Is there a motion to approve this item? Regent Seal, is there a second? Second. Regent, Regent Levy. Uh, any discussion or questions about this item? All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay, and the motion passes. Matthew, is there any other business to come before the Finance Committee today? No, sir. All right, hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So Regent Levy, is there a second? second. Regent Williams Brown, any discussion or questions? All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Solomon. Uh, next is the Legislative Committee. Regent Perez was unable to join us today, so uh, Regent Sterling. If you will uh, call the committee to order, please. Thank you, Chair Temple. Certainly a tall order on the celebration of the wonderful report we just received in funding, but the legislative action is, I think, a part of that team that made that happen. So uh, I'd like to call the legislative committee to order, and I'm going to ask Doreen to please call the roll. Thank you. Um, Regent Perez. Regent Sterling. Here. Regent David. Here. Regent Lobre. Here. Regent May, Regent McDonald, Here. Regent Perez, Regent Williams Brown. Here. Uh, the LCTCS system, uh, here. the LSU system, Southern University system, UL system. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. We will now move to item three, the legislative update. Doreen, would you please proceed? Yes, thank you. So uh, I'm going to present the legislative agenda, um, the final outcome of the legislation that was deemed a priority for the Board of Regents, as well as uh, other legislation that impacts your work. I'm going to ask the commissioner to, to tag team with me. I, I stepped in at the end of the process, so there may be some questions related to some of this legislation that occurred uh, before my involvement. But I'll walk through those bills that you have been hearing um, Aaron speak about and just let you know how those ended. The first of those is the uh, Senate Bill 261, which is now Act 308, signed by the governor this week, a relative to universal transfer. Uh, this bill uh, seeks to improve the course by course transfer and, um, and develop transfer pathways, allowing students to build course credits towards an associate's degree with a guarantee that all 60 hours will count towards the degree they're seeking no matter where they end up going to college. 
Act 208 is relative to dual enrollment counseling. Uh, this will add uh, dual enrollment to early college opportunities such as advanced placement and international baccalaureate uh, to the official list of offerings to be shared by counselors with high school students as they're planning their class schedules and beginning their college exploration. Act 147, relative LUMCON, puts LUMCON uh, in the same posture as other specialized institutions such as Pennington, Southern, and the LSU Ag Centers, which uh, allows them the ability to uh, recover from storm damage by uh, allowing them to pursue construction projects uh, below a certain dollar amount. Senate Bill 297, um, by Senator Regina Barrow, uh, basically um, substitutes the one rotating higher education Title IX seat on the power-based review panel uh, to adding a representative from each institution. Uh, Senate Bill 178, rel relative to the TOPS executive order codification. So this basically uh, codifies the governor's executive order um, so that students are not uh, penalized for circumstances beyond their control. This has been done for uh, past hurricanes such as Delta and Zeta. There were also several resolutions that were filed. Uh, we recognized HBCU Day, the 50th anniversary of the enactment of Title IX, and um, support for the uh, resiliency pilot program at Fletcher Community College. This is the pilot that's tied to the Regents work underway to assess campus needs proactively as we focus on how to hard, harden our campuses and position our campuses to accelerate community recovery post storm. There were other pieces of legislation that impact our work, um, notably Act 205 re relative to reverse transfer by Representative Kim Brass. This is the, uh, the bill that's designed to award <coughs> associate degrees to students at four year institutions who have earn the credits needed for an associate's degree. The Board of Regents, uh, in collaboration with the Statewide Articulation and Transfer Council, uh, will implement the process for this uh, transfer pr program. House Bill 546, relative to the practice core entrance exam, you heard about this in the, morning, this, the meeting this morning, removes the requirement that a person pass the pre-entrance practice core aptitude exam before being admitted into a university teacher prep program. Uh, you also heard uh, House Bill 346 relative to scholarships uh, creating the Go Teach program. Regents will administer the fund through LOSFA, and as they noted, uh, five million has been put into the fund with 1.25 appropriated for FY23. Uh, House Bill 888 by Representative Barbara Freiberg created a hunger-free campus designation. Uh, the Board of Regents will initiate this recognition program for post-secondary education institutions. Uh, there's no funding provided at this time, but we will create uh, the program designation. Senate Bill 81 uh, is a TOPS reporting bill we just want to make you aware of. Uh, this will remove the requirement that the TOPS information reporting system include parents' household income from the demographic information relative to award recipients. We will still have access to that information as the Board of Regents, but it will not be included in the annual report. There were two pieces of legislation uh, by Senator Sharon Hewitt. Senate Bill 190 creates the Computer Science Education Advisory Commis Commission to provide recommendations to Bessie for the development and implementation of a state action plan for the del delivery of computer science education in public schools. The commissioner, as well as the board chair, have appointees to this commission. And then Senate Bill 191 adds computer coding as an option to satisfy the foreign language requirement for the TOPS University Diploma for students who graduate during or after the 26-27 school year. Senate Bill 192, uh, the Post-Secondary Inclusive Education Fund created. Uh, this is a bill by Senator Gerald Boudreaux. It sets up an advisory council to assist in creating and expanding comprehensive, inclusive post-secondary education programs um, to increase independent living and uh, employment opportunities for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, there is $1 million in the Higher Ed Initiatives Fund for this program. Senate Bill 317 by Senator Franklin Foyle provides in-state residency status for military families and veterans. Uh, Louisiana institutions already provide this status, but the bill codifies the practice. 
And I just will mention um, Senate Bill 434 by uh, Senator Fields. That, that was the retirement bill that was discussed this morning for K through 12 teachers. It also includes nursing faculty because um, we, we've talked about the nursing shortage. So there's an opportunity for uh, prior, retired nursing faculty to come back to teach. If you don't have any questions, I can speak about just a few resolutions that uh, task the Board of Regents. May I have yes, sir. Question, On the uh, reverse transfer to allow students who have earned enough credits to have an associate degree and are enrolled perhaps in a four year school, how does that, is it self executing? Will the uh, universities go back automatically? A lot of the universities are not awarding associate degrees. Would they go back to, for example, a transferring uh, two-year community college and say, we've got all these hours, we think that person qualifies, how's it gonna work? Yeah, yeah so uh, actually uh, we, we met with the State Articulation and Transfer Council earlier this week to, to work out exactly how this, um, this might be put into practice. So we here at the Board of Regents have all of the data from all of the public institutions, and so we are positioned to be able to at least run some computer codes to be able to identify students who are plausible candidates for reverse transfer awards. We'll be able to see all of the, their full transcript from all of the different schools that they might have attended, and then that way we can provide that information both to the awarding school and also to the other schools who may well need to arrange to have that, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that coursework transferred to the awarding school. This is going to be substantial, it seems to me, almost immediately it's going to increase our percentage of uh, credentials. It will. I, I, our, our preliminary uh, uh, analysis suggests that there are perhaps thousands of people who are across the state right now who actually are eligible for a reverse transfer award, but were not provided that award in the past. And something in the order of four to 500 people each year who become eligible for a reverse transfer award who will now be eligible. No how, yeah, how far back are you and all gonna go? Get <laughs> right, so exactly. So w w w the intention is exactly to, uh, to, uh, to contact people who, who have perhaps left five, six, seven years ago and we may well be able to send them a very, a very attractive letter saying congratulations. We would like to, uh, to, to recognize the, uh, the work that you have done. Yeah. That is transformative, thank you. Any other questions? Doreen, you can proceed yeah, with your additional comments. Thank you. Uh, I'll just go through a, a, f a couple of um, a few resolutions. Uh, Representative Jason Hughes had uh, House Resolution 161 that requests the Board of Regents and LASFA uh, and the pub public post-secondary education institutions to take actions to improve uh, post-secondary education outcomes in Louisiana as a result of the pandemic. SCR 6 by Senator Stuart Cathy creates a task force to study and make recommended recommendations relative to tenure policies of post-public sec public, post-secondary education institutions. The commissioner has an appointment to that task force. There will be legislators, the president of each system, and faculty member from each system participating. SCR 49 uh, by Senator Cleo Fields uh, brought requested by LCTCS to clarify legislative intent regarding the MJ Foster Promise Program that students do not have to take out federal student loans before they are eligible to receive a scholarship. This affirms the Regents approved policy stating the same focusing on lo loan avoidance. Uh, and then finally, uh, 196 by Senator Cameron Henry. Um, you heard me talk a little bit of earlier about co computer coding. His resolution requests the Board of Regents and Bessie to include computer coding and American Sign Language as course equivalents for top score curriculum and high school graduation requirements. And that's all I have as our package. We probably tracked about 100 bills. 60 of those became enrolled. So there's a lot of, besides what I just went over, there's a lot of bills that we, that we monitor through the process. Members, are there any other questions for Doreen? Doreen, we recognize you for your extraordinary efforts. You, you do it so beautifully and do it so well. You make it look easy. So thank you for your leadership. And certainly, Madam Commissioner and the rest of the team, um, this investment in education and this ongoing work to 
transform our citizens and their ability to have credentials and to be able to take care of themselves and their family is significant. So we, we appreciate your leadership. Is there any other business to come before the Legislative Committee? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Motion by Regent Levy and second by Regent Davi. Any discussion, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes, we are adjourned. Thank you, Doreen, thank you, team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So as we move on, next up, Facilities and Property Committee. Mr. Hit, uh, Chris Herring, um, Regent Meyer is, is unable to attend, so Regent Levy, if you'll take the reins, okay. please, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, we will call the committee to order, and uh, Chris, if you would uh, um, do the roll call. Yes, sir. Regent Meir, Regent Levy, Here. Regent Ewing, Regent McDonald, Here. Regent Weil, Here. Regent Lobrey, Here. LSU representative, Southern University System Representative, Supervisor Mount, Supervisor Romero. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Chris. We, we will go to the consent agenda. Yes, sir. The first item is the consent agenda, which contains the small capital projects and two third party projects approved since these were last brought before the committee. There are 19 small capital projects and two small third party projects. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has one. There are a whole bunch of things on here, folks. Do you want to ask about any of them particularly? If not, then Chris, we need to have a motion to approve all of the projects listed in the consent agenda. So moved. Thank you, Felix. Is there any, uh, any opposition to the motion? Hearing none, that is approved. Next, we will have uh, a next item uh, would be the capital outlay update. Yes, sir. This is uh, just an informational item following up on all the, uh, the other good news presented thus far. Uh, capital outlay fared uh, extremely well uh, as well this session. We were appropriated $312.8 million in priority ones, two, and cash sources, which represent the largest capital outlay uh, allocation to higher education. That's a $137.4 million increase versus fiscal year 22. We have 87 projects that were funded, and this includes uh, major projects that are at various stages of development across all four systems and LUMCON. We also received 50 million for deferred maintenance this year, which is the most um, higher ed has received since 2008. Um, and the, the next slide contains a, a summary um, by funding source, by system. Um, again, priorities one, two, and cash um, will be utilized in fiscal year 23. Priority five represents um, funding for future years, which you can see is uh, almost a billion dollars in, in projects um, upcoming. Um, the, the last two items are, are revenue bonds, which are sold by the institutions to fund projects and fees and self-gen, which can be uh, uh, fees or, or, or grant funding, a, a variety of things. But I'd be happy to answer any questions on a specific uh, school or campus. Yes, um, uh, <clears throat> Chris, is the small project that we talked about in this, or is that something in addition to these projects? No, that would be done as a deferred maintenance uh, project next year. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions, Chris? All right, if what, not. What, what are the Board of Regents projects? Is that LUMCON or? The three of them, yes, are LUMCON. The, uh, the first phase of the HOMA site, which is under construction and should be complete by October. The second phase of that project is included, which is um, installing a slip and a bulkhead so they'll be able to park the new vessel and the, uh, the research vessel funded by NSF. Um, the Pelican replacement is a component of that. Then we have um, appropriated to us is uh, money for land acquisition, <clears throat> excuse me, which is going to UL for the Lady of Lords acquisition. Um, they've acquired one parcel and they have another eight uh, acres plus. They're working on finalizing that. And then um, there's an appropriation for um, lining, to, for um, laying fiber and purchasing equipment, and then the deferred maintenance amount. 
Any further questions? This would not require a motion, correct? This is informational only? Correct. All right. Is there any other business to come before the committee? No, sir. All right, then. We have a motion to adjourn. Blake, would you like to make a motion sure, to adjourn? Not <laughs> Mr. McDonald, do we have a second? A second. Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned. Way to jump in there. <laughs> <laughs> So next up is the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. Regent David, please call your committee to order, sir. Happily, uh, yes, we're gonna call the Academic and Student Affairs Committee to order. Dr. Denley, will you please call the roll? Here. Justin, can you turn your mic on? Yeah. So sorry. Regent Finley. Regent Pryor. Regent Solomon. Here. Regent Sterling. Here. Regent William Brown. Here. Regent LeBray. Here. LCTCS representative. Here. LSU representative. Southern representative. And UL system representative. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Dr. Denley. Uh, now moving to item three, the consent agenda. Can you yeah. proceed on that? I can if I can keep my keep my we've name had, from had, falling we've had over. Name placard issues today. For sure. I have. Uh, <laughs> there we go. So today's consent agenda is we have uh, four uh, really standard uh, approval items from uh, from from region staff. There are two name changes of degree programs and two undergraduate certificates, and then we also have uh, 36 progress reports of new programs that have been approved recently. Uh, and so our senior staff recommends approval of those consent agenda items. Thank you, Dr. Denley. Uh, Y'all have heard the recommendations or a motion to approve the items of the consent agenda. So oh, moved. Uh, moved from Regent Williams-Brown and a second from Regent Solomon. Uh, any discussion or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's a Lafayette way of saying it. <laughs> uh, now moving to academic programs, Dr. Denley. Yeah, so we have three uh, new academic programs uh, that I present to you today. Uh, the, the first is an Associate of Applied Science in Computer Information Systems at, uh, at Fletcher Community College. So this proposed 60-hour program was developed in response to a growing need for network security and IT type programs in the region, as well as a need to diversify college offerings uh, due to the increase in remote workforce expedited by the pandemic. So uh, this, uh, we, we really uh, project that in the uh, home of bio region, uh, that there will be 150 jobs uh, that are exactly in this kind of field. The only other associate level CIS program in the state right now is located in, uh, in Bossier in North Louisiana. And so this really will uh, provide a very significant addition to the state's offerings around associate level uh, computer science training. So that's the uh, AAS uh, in computer information systems there at Fletcher. Uh, the, the next program is an Associate of Science in Nursing at North Shore. Uh, the proposed program is an ASN, a 72 credit hour program designed to prepare students for immediate employment at entry level, re entry level registered nurses uh, after they have completed their NCLEX exam. Uh, the, the, the way in which this program has been structured, and this is uh, common in the LCTCS system, is to, to take the structure of an already existing uh, successful program and really replicate that, that same curricular structure at, at a sister institution. So that's exactly the way in which they've approached this, uh, this program. One, one question. Yes, ma'am. Will that now mean, do we, will we have an ASN program at every community college? Uh, I, I, I do not know that offhand, but I will happy to be happy to, 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 to look that up and, and get to you, of course. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so according to the, the, the State Board of Nursing, of course, there, there is a, a significant regional shortage 
uh, throughout the state. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why we certainly are very happy to, to welcome the addition of additional nursing capacity. And then the final program is a, a proposed Master of Science in Clinical Mental Health Counseling at McNeese. Uh, so this proposed program will be a 60-hour MS program, uh, and really it builds on an existing uh, co concentration within a master's program in counseling, which already exists at McNeese. And so the, the proposition is to take that existing uh, concentration and move it into a standalone Masters in Clinical Mental Health Counseling. By moving it into that standalone uh, degree itself, it will then be eligible for KCREP accreditation, and they certainly anticipate seeking that accreditation. Uh, so it's my pleasure. Uh, senior staff recommends approval of the academic programs as presented today. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you Thank might you have. That recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the three academic programs? So moved. Uh, Regent Sterling and second by Regent McDonald. Um, any discussion or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Any other business to come before the committee? There is not. Hearing none, I can wait a motion to adjourn. All right. Wait a second. <laughs> Do we have to vote on the motion? Second. <laughs> Sterling seconds. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All right. We are adjourned. Now on to the Research and Sponsored Initiatives Committee meeting. I'd like to call the Research and Sponsored Initiatives Committee to order. Ms. Robinson, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Regent Wild. Regent Here. Regent May. Regent Finley. Regent Meir. Regent Seal. Here. Regent Solomon. Here. We'll need a member of the executive committee to form a quorum. Uh, Regent while I uh, appoint Regent Blake David. Now, I haven't had this conversation, but I know he's ready uh, <laughs> to sit on, uh, you, you know, until we got a quorum. Go ahead. Thank you. Let's proceed then with the uh, consent agenda. Yes, sir. The consent agenda includes one item. It's an appointment of endowed shareholders without national search at UL Monroe. There are two chairs that are affected by this action. Both of the proposed holders are senior level administrators at UL Monroe and are very highly productive faculty, and the senior staff recommends approval. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move it. Second. Okay. Re uh, Regent McDonald uh, moves and Regent David seconds. All right. Uh, I think we can move on to the next item. Get, I got a vote on it. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Uh, we will now move to item number three, the Louisiana Cybersecurity Talent Initiative Fund Update and Overview of Louisiana's Cybersecurity Landscape. Thank Board. you, sir. Uh, I will provide just a brief uh, recap of the Cybersecurity Education Management Council's work and the Cyber Security Talent Initiative Fund Update. If you'll recall, in April, we brought uh, action to the board to approve the CEMC to make funding decisions for the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative Fund uh, on its behalf. The uh, CEMC has now done this. Both of these bodies, by the way, are created in statute, and so both are legislatively created, and the fund has received $2 million to date, uh, a million for the current year and a million uh, for the year forthcoming. Uh, four applications, six applications were submitted to the fund for funding. Four were selected for funding based on the scoring rubric that was published with the uh, request for applications. Those four projects are at Louisiana Tech, LSU A&M, the Southern University System, and Bossier Parish Community College. Uh, I would note that you can see the statewide reach of this program by seeing that the campuses which, were, which are receiving the awards are all over the state. Uh, and in addition, the Bossier Parish Award includes some funding to uh, support Fletcher, 
uh, Technical Community College as it adopts a version of Bossier Parish's program at its campus. So the reach of these dollars is very wide ranging. I also want to let you know just a little bit about what the programs have been able to accomplish to date. We have, uh, by this action, expended $2 million so far uh, in these programs. 17 proposals have been submitted. Uh, 11 of those have been funded. A uh, $1 million plus has been uh, pledged in industry match. The only reason that we say pledged there is that those funds necessarily haven't all been expended to date, but they are on the books and ready for expenditure. And over 600 students have been reached so far in only two years of work. It's a really remarkable result. Uh, in terms of year one, uh, most of the projects that were funded this year are continuations of year one projects. And you can see uh, in these slides some of the things that we've been able to accomplish in year one of the project. Most of the things that we've accomplished are getting certificates and training to students, providing scholarship services, wraparound services, uh, specific certifications in cybersecurity programs. Um, we have serviced uh, underrepresented minority students. We have serviced many, many women through these programs. So everything that these programs are doing aligns beautifully with the board's master plan and our priorities moving forward. So we've had projects at Bossier Parish, uh, at Northwestern State University, LSU Shreveport, uh, which is a joint effort uh, between their education and computer science programs, uh, Louisiana Tech, which is expanding their talent in cybersecurity and providing uh, uh, scholarship support to numerous students across the campus, uh, as well as a Southern University System initiative. This, this is an important initiative because it is at the system level. It is actually supporting work across all of the campuses in the Southern System. And finally, uh, the Firestarter Project at LSU A&M. Uh, together, as I said, we have serviced so far over 600 students and many, many more to come. This has been a highly successful initiative to date, and fortunately the funds are recurring, so we look forward to many years of support. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Denley to provide a landscape of cybersecurity programs. Thanks so much. And, uh, uh, given the interest of the, the last meeting around cybersecurity, we thought it would be helpful to at least give some sort of an overview about exactly how the six programs we've just been talking about, how they fit into the overall cybersecurity landscape across the state and how those programs that we have are really trying to, to meet the workforce need that we anticipate uh, across the state. So those are the, the six programs that, that Kerry has just been discussing. Altogether, actually, there are 15 institutions that currently have cyber security serving programs uh, and altogether 25 programs that those 15 institutions uh, uh, have. Th those programs range from, uh, from certification programs and you've seen some of those mentioned today, Com CompTIA Security Plus is an incredibly attractive and needed certification in the cybersecurity realm all the way across associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and even doctoral degrees in, in cybersecurity. So we certainly are building out a very significant amount of program infrastructure around cybersecurity. But I think, uh, and, and last, uh, the presenter who was here last, uh, last month uh, really, I think, did a very good job of communicating the fact that there is an extraordinary need across this state and across, across, across the nation for people who have skills and training in cybersecurity. Currently, we are graduating, you can see, a very significant increase in growth in folk who have degrees and qualifications in cybersecurity at various levels. So we, just back in 2017-18, that was right around 100 students. We're now climbing up to close to 300. The, the degree programs, the 25 programs that I, I mentioned earlier, they are at all kinds of different places in their evolution, but most, most are at their early stages of uh, enrollment. So they, many of them have just in, enrolled maybe their first or their second or perhaps their third 
incoming class of students. They're gradually building their enrollment towards graduate, graduation and completion. Currently, we have somewhere in the order of 1,000 students across the state who are enrolled in those programs at various stages. But even when we get to full, full capacity, when those programs are at full maturity, we will be graduating somewhere in the order of 350 to 400 students. To put that in perspective, if we now look across the state at the number of open positions, the number of jobs in cybersecurity at current levels, those jobs are of the order of about 1,000 open positions a year and climbing every month. We are currently at a position where only about two in five of those open positions are able to be filled. So only about 400 of the 1,000 open positions in cybersecurity are able to be filled by the existing workforce here in Louisiana. About 600 positions go without being able to find uh, an appropriately qualified candidate. Similarly, and uh, I shared a little bit of this last year, uh, last time in, uh, in our uh, board development, we could look inside to see what, uh, you know, who are the people who are currently working in cybersecurity fields and where did they get their, uh, their, their training, their education? Typically speaking, if we, look at, if we look at teaching, or we look at nursing, or we look at more established, more, uh, more established kinds of uh, jobs, jobs and careers, somewhere in the region of 85 to 90 percent of the current Louisiana workforce in, for instance, nursing or uh, teacher education, they have received their education and training from public institutions and private in institutions here in the state. If we look at cybersecurity, it's about 65% of the current workforce who are working in cybersecurity who have received their education from schools in Louisiana, public and private. About a third of those people have received education from all over the country. So again, it's very clear. There is a very significant need for us to even yet increase the capacity that we have for cybersecurity training, cybersecurity education at all levels, from certification to short term certificate, all the way through to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral level training. Well, what's also the case, and again, we, 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 we talked about this a little last time as part of that conversation, is that as things currently stand, essentially all of the cybersecurity education that we have here in the state, state is centered around computer science. Uh, the, 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 perhaps the unique distinction is Louisiana Tech's cybersecurity engineering program, but still effectively in that computer science and technology realm. I, I'm sure that I don't need to convince you that we need people who have cybersecurity training and exposure and skills in effectively every kind of endeavor across the state, from, from oil and gas to, 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 to maritime. To, to, you, you, it's very difficult to put your finger on any possible endeavor across the state where we don't need people who know that industry, know that, that specialty, but also are able to speak uh, cybersecurity. And so that's, again, is one of the things that we would very much to like to build capacity all across our degree programs, ways in which students might be able to, as well as part of their, the undertaking of their, the, the, the other parts of their degrees, to also be able to incorporate some exposure, some uh, involvement in a, some kind of cybersecurity-based education as well. So happy to answer any questions that you have around cybersecurity landscape. Yes, sir. Dr. Finley, do you know from your experience in Georgia or Tennessee or, or otherwise uh, how other states are approaching the cybersecurity question in terms of uh, funding higher education? By that I mean uh, what we're doing apparently is allowing the institutions to bubble up their own proposals bring them forward to us for approval and integration, and then we approve them, and then they implement them. But uh, is there another model that you're familiar with uh, for how this is being done in the country? So I think actually the way that you've just exp uh, explained it is pretty much the way that it's being approached is basically every state right now. 
Uh, what's, I think, good news for, for us here is the changes that we have now made around new program approval and academic planning allows us to approach it in a somewhat different way. In, uh, in, this, in, in, in the early spring, in, in September, uh, you will be, be able to see the, the new academic plans that all of the schools and all of the systems here in Louisiana will be proposing for in the, initially for this one year and then uh, in 2023 and there on after for three-year plans. And so we here then have the opportunity to be able to, to create that, that cohesive approach, that coordinated approach really to be able to, to meet the need, of course, not only in cybersecurity, but in, in all of the different uh, aspects of the state's need. I think it's also the case that th this, um, the, the, the programs that we've been talking about, the, the funds that have been allocated to, to create this capacity this is also somewhat unusual across the country and really provides, I think, a wonderful opportunity on an ongoing basis. Right now, we have been able to build capacity at those six institutions. There is a much, much to talk about how it is that we can now create a, a collaboration between institutions. You're beginning to see that with the, the way in which Bozier will be able to be working with Fletcher to be able to, to, to create that kind of collaborative um, program across the state. There are other ways in which I believe we can replicate that kind of collaborative approach to create the capacity that we need. Thank you. No, thank you. Any, any, any other questions? Okay. Uh, is there any other business to come before the Research and Sponsored Initiatives Committee? No, sir. Anyone? Any objection to adjournment? No. We are adjourned. All right, great job. So now on the statewide programs committee meeting, uh, Regent Ewing was not able to be here, but Regent McDonald, please call your committee to order. And before I go any <coughs> further, um, I was going to save this for comments, but I might as well do it now. We have been missing Regent McDonald in action, but he is now back and uh, completely engaged. And, sir, we appreciate your prior service before you were a regent and uh, – the service you've given since you have been a regent, and we're very, very excited and happy that you're back and doing well. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I thought about voting against that endowed scholarship yeah, I, at ULM just to see if he was paying attention, but <laughs> <laughs> he, he, moved, he moved to approve it. He so moved uh, real <laughs> quick. <laughs> I'd like to call the uh, statewide programs committee to order. Uh, Dr. Boutet, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Regent Ewing, Vice Chair uh, McDonald, Regent Finley, Regent Meir, Regent Pryor, Regent Weil. Here. Regent Lobre. Here. Yes, sir, we will need an appointment from the Executive Committee to form a Mr. quorum. Mr. Chairman, would you be kind enough to appoint a Member, we'll have a quorum. Yes, uh, I've had an extensive conversation with uh, Regent Solomon, and he is more than ready and, and prepared to step in. <laughs> so you may proceed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Regent Solomon. Hey, Regents, you have three consent agenda items, which we will take a motion in Globo at the end. The first one is final rulemaking. The first two are dual enrollment. The first one is final rulemaking for dual enrollment to be able to add African-American history as a top score equivalent uh, that can be graded on a 5.0 scale. The second item is a follow-on of what you approved this morning at the joint VOR BESI committee meeting. So how about that for zero lag time? This is approval of initial rulemaking to add DE in uh, psychology as a top score equivalent. That can also be graded on a 5.0 scale. And the next one is eight requests for exceptions. And these are exceptions that you normally see. These are those for the ability to maintain continuous full-time enrollment and earn the hours. And the LOSPA Advisory Board has reviewed each of these items and they recommend approval of all consent agenda items. Members, is there a motion to approve these items on the consent So moved, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Regent Solomon. <clears throat> Second. 
A second. Yeah, it's Regent, Regent Lombray. Thank you for the second. Uh, any discussions, any questions at this point? Not all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion passed. Uh, Dr. Buta, you okay. want to continue? The next item is not a consent agenda item this time. We will move this to consent agenda items in the subsequent meetings, but this is the first time that you've heard these exceptions. This is an exception for TOPS to the requirement that a student begins home study no later than the conclusion of the 10th grade. The statute states that they have to be in home study the entire amount of the 11th grade and the 12th grade. However, the legislature has tasked LOSFA with bringing to them issues that we see that can be addressed legislatively should they choose. This was one of those. We've had instances where students have been bullied. We've had instances where students have fallen ill after the end of the 10th grade and had to go on home study. And of course, there would be no way that those students would have been able to complete two years. In the past, before this legislation, those students were ineligible for TOPS because there was no authority that LOSFA had to grant these exceptions. So you now have that authority. So you are seeing this is just basically the background of the fact that you do have legislative approval to do this. These do come before the LOSFA Advisory Board, as do the other exceptions you're accustomed to seeing. And we do have two on this first round, and the Advisory Board has reviewed the documentation <coughs> and recommends approval of both cases. Thank you, Dr. Butte. Can I get a motion to approve uh, these uh, recommendations of the LOSFA Advisory Board? Motion? A second. Uh, Regent Solomon. Uh, second. Regent LeBray. Thank you. Uh, any questions? All in favor of the motions, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion passed. Dr. Butte. Okay. All right. The next item is uh, you recall regions that you commissioned HCM strategists to do a survey of the GO grant. Uh, and as a follow-up, what the commissioner wanted us to do is to work with student financial aid administrators and our advisory board, which is also representatives of student financial aid as well as high school counselors, to be able to look at those recommendations and then give you a response on how well we've been, been able to meet those or what barriers there might have been to meeting them. And so this is that study report. We're going to hit the highlights of it. And this will be asking you to receive this report. The first thing that it tasked and said that would be great for GO to have would be predictable new investments. Fortunately, uh, as you've all heard great news, uh, we were successful through the combined efforts of this great Regents team and the Louisiana legislature and the governor with getting $11 million last year. And that was not, you know, lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place, so we've got lightning in a bottle. So this year we got $15 million in an increase for the next fiscal year included in the budget. So I do believe that we have met uh, this um, task of being on the path towards predictability in investments. Then the 60% target, there was a recommendation that that be removed. To refresh the memories, and uh, Regent Lowbray, since you are new, basically what the 60% target did was to make go a last dollar program, meaning you had to combine all of the aid that the student received. And at the end of the day, you total up everything that they have, and you look at what the federal government says they're expected to contribute. Then you're going to have that difference. You're going to have that student's unmet need. We had a priority in GO that said that you can't give them a GO grant that exceeds 60% of that unmet need. Now that was done because there wasn't enough money and it was a way of kind of spreading the wealth. But as in everything that you do, you're going to have intended consequences and unintended consequences. And generally, generally speaking, in last dollar programs, 
The children that are most adversely affected are students with greatest need who are also meritorious. That's kind of what we want them to do, right? So why is that? If I have great need, I'm going to get a high Pell Grant, right? If I'm meritorious, I'm going to get tops. Perhaps I get other institutional aid. Guess what? My 60% of unmet need is going to be all filled up. And I, the neediest of all students, might not even get a GO Grant, or I'm the one that gets a reduced GO Grant. But I still have significant amounts of money that have to be paid for school that I have to foot. And, and for some students, that's between eight, 12, 13, 14 thousand dollars. So there was a recommendation that the 60% be removed. And we asked the Advisory Council of Financial Aid Administrators what they thought about this because they've had this academic year, the 21-22 academic year, to actually implement this. So here are their comments, and uh, I will tell you, I'm not sure if my, our favorite one is here. If it's not, I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase it for you. There was widespread removal of the 60% target, widespread support for it. Uh, they basically said that it provided greater flexibility to give those neediest students additional aid. That's the scenario I just talked about. Um, they mentioned uh, that increased funding along with the removal of that target reduced their need to recalculate mid-year. So let's say I've, recal I've calculated your 60%. I've given you the remaining in loans because I can't give it to you and go. And then, oh, lo and behold, you get another scholarship. Okay, well, if you are over your 60%, I've got to go back and repackage you and recalculate you. Well, most of you that know anything about folks that work in financial aid, they're not fans of that because that means they've got to go back and do loans and do that paperwork all over again. That is another thing that led to that predictability comment. For a student, I think I've got it, and then I get something else and you penalize me for getting more aid, but I still have costs left. So this removal reduced that workload and increased the amount they could give to the neediest students. My favorite quote, I'm gonna give the tail in, it said, we're so glad, something like, we're so glad you took that out of there. Please don't ever put that back in there again. I think that's as plain as it gets. <laughs> there was support. We also asked if there was support for an increase to the maximum of $3,000 for GO. The minimum is currently $300, the maximum is currently $3,000. Most post-secondary campuses supported an increase with a condition that they still have the flexibility if they chose to award less than the maximum so that they could give more students A. They said, you can increase the maximum, but if you do that and take away my flexibility and tell me I have to give everybody the maximum, then what do you think is gonna happen? I'm going to award fewer students the maximum. So they wanted to be able to make those decisions at their campus levels based on their campus packaging policies. They wanted you to allow them to continue that flexibility, which you have done. The Lossley Advisory Board uh, has reviewed the report as well and commented on it, and they do recommend that you receive the Go Grant Study Group report. I might add that if the maximum is increased, that is the prerogative of this board. So you're receiving the report, if you chose later to bring an action item that you wanted to increase the maximum, that would be up to you, but that is not what you're doing today. Today, you're, uh, we're asking that you receive the report. Okay, <clears throat> what you're saying is we're not taking action to raise the maximum. No, sir. We're just taking action to receive the report. Yes, sir. And what I heard you say two or three times is if it's ever passed, by the Board of Regents, the, you will have flexibility that you won't have to go up to the 3,000. You can manage it, adjust it so that those dollars go further to help other students, right? Yes, sir. That is what and the campuses the are asking of you. Uh, we appreciate added money to the Go Grant Certainly. program this year, and we, we appreciate that. Are there any questions from, from the committee? If not, is there a motion to receive the, the Go Grants 
study group report. It's a study group report. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, a Regent Weil uh, makes the motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Yes, we have a second by a Regent uh, Brown. Uh, are there any discussion, any questions? If there are not any, would all in favor, would you please say aye? Aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. No nays, so the motion passes. I think we're ready, Dr. Boutte, for adjournment. You don't have any I, I have one uh, please do that will be very brief on. Uh, this morning there was a question. Mr. Chair, do you, you want me to proceed? Okay. This morning there was a question during the joint Board of Regents Bessie meeting about how dual enrollment hours affects TOPS funding. The question was specifically, does it save money in TOPS? As a general rule, no. Here's the reason why. We love for students to come to post-secondary well prepared, right? But when they come well prepared, that doesn't change the amount of the award. A TOPS award, if the student qualifies during a regular by the April ACT, is eight semesters. It's eight semesters. Whether you come in technically qualified as a junior because all of your AP and dual enrollment courses or whether you come in as straight out of the bat freshman. So if you did not need to use all of your eight semesters paid by TOPS because you have so many credits, what happens? Do we take it away from you? No. We roll it over, and it is there for you to use for graduate and professional school. Could you do something similar to what Regent Lobre said? I got a certification. I went to work. And then I saw that they started promoting, I mean, you were like poster child. They started promoting people that had a baccalaureate degree, and I'm like, hold up a minute, right? So the TOPS law currently gives that student, when you finish that degree, you have a year. They could finish, take a year to work, have that aha moment and say, coming back, I'd like the rest of my TOPS, please. So that is for the eight semesters of TOPS Opportunity Performance and Honors. That is for the two years of TOPS Tech. So if they came in with that associates, they could still use that two years to get a another type of certification or credential or short term. So it doesn't necessarily save you money because it is there for the student to be able to utilize. It could actually cost you more money because then it's more attractive for students to say, well, hey, now that you've opened it up to the different courses, I think I do want to accept that. I think I will take you up on that deal. So that was just a point of clarification. Uh, Dr. Boutte, and we need to probably schedule a session and we'll talk to the chairman about this one later because to, to, TOPS gets pretty confusing sometimes as far as who's eligible, how many years they're eligible, and et cetera. It, it worries me that uh, when I passed that bill, uh, we said, you know, uh, eight, some about four years, mm -hmm. and now we're talking about getting two years of college in high school, mm -hmm. and then you come to the university uh, do you get do you get four years after already having two years? Those are some questions that'll come up. I don't want to delay things this afternoon, but later, okay. be prepared to come back and let's let's Sorry. talk about that. We want we don't want tops funding. I think it's over three hundred million now. So how far can we go, and how far is the governor and the legislature willing to go? So we need to. Thank you. I think, do you have anything else, Dr. Boutte? No, sir, that's it. Does Please. anyone else have anything to discuss? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Um, Regent while, uh, mm -hmm. while uh, makes a motion to adjourn, a second by Regent Labray. Uh, any discussions or questions before we adjourn? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion's passed and we're adjourned, Mr. Chairman. So, did, did, now, did you see how Regent McDonald read your mind and knew that you were going to make that second? Yeah. Right? Did you see how that, that's where we, we get to where we really are, are good here? We can do it like that, right? So thank you for that. And thank you for that clarification. Um, and so 
You all next up is planning, research, and performance. Uh, Regent Sterling, please call your committee to order, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call the Planning, Research, and Performance Committee to order. Dr. Craig, would you call the roll, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. Regent Sterling. Here. Regent Williams Brown. Here. Regent Finley. Regent Levy. Here. Regent McDonald. Here. Regent Perez. Regent Pryor. Regent Weil. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. We will now move to item three, the consent agenda. Dr. Craig, please proceed. Uh, yes, yeah, so on the consent agenda, our first uh, PRP item um, includes three items. We've got our first initial um, item is licensure. We have one initial um, application for licensure, which is Oral Roberts University. Uh, this is a private institution in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but it has a location in Mandeville um, in, uh, in Louisiana at the Church of King. Um, church, excuse me, Church of the King in Mandeville. Um, it's accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, um, offers 30 academic programs, and has 84 Louisiana students. Uh, in addition, we have five renewal um, application. Uh, Central Texas College, which is from Killeen, Texas, has a location in Fort Polk, uh, Louisiana. Uh, they are accredited by uh, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, or SACS, uh, 30 academic programs and 217 Louisiana students. Infinity College is a private institution with its main campus in Lafayette, Louisiana. They are accredited by the Council on Occupational Education. There are um, 30 students enrolled in, uh, the, in two programs. Uh, National University is out, to, out of San Diego, California. Uh, they are accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, have 81 academic programs and 85 Louisiana students. REACH University is out of Oakland, California. Uh, they, are all, they are accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Um, REACH primarily operates um, in Louisiana as Oxford Teachers College. Um, they have a very large program, uh, a paraprofessional to the um, uh, bachelor's degree program, and they have 235 Louisiana students. Um, and finally, Relay Graduate School of Education. Um, Relay has a New Orleans location. They are located out of New York City, New York, but they're, um, they have a location in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Baton Rouge, and Relay uh, typically, well, for quite some time, has had a, uh, um, a principal's academy in the New Orleans area that um, principals have gotten their ma uh, master's degree um, in, in um, administration, but they also have several uh, bachelor's degrees in uh, multiple teaching disciplines. The third consent um, item, or it's, it's actually our second item, but it is, um, we've got uh, our second item, excuse me, are the renewal applications for, actually, uh, I went too far. Okay, excuse me, having trouble with the clicker today. Um, we have four initial applications for um, proprietary schools listed here. We've got truck driving, um, HVAC, some um, uh, brow canvas is um, microblading. microblading, thank you. And uh, then the Louisiana Green Corp. And then we have 17 renewal applications. Um, for proprietary schools. And then our third item on the consent agenda is our um, approval of initial rulemaking. We are in the process of, of taking our um, licensure process for proprietary schools and making it completely an online process. And um, so as we were going through this process with our contractor at Vera, we found that there was um, a listing of forms 
as well as the, the need for one of those forms to be notarized. Those particular items do not need to be in the rule and we need this program to be flexible so that if we need to change forms or, or say not require a uh, notary, that this that we can do so without having to change the rule. And so what we are um, asking here is um, allowing us to do this. And so we recommend the board approve the items on the consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Members, are there any questions? You've heard the recommendations from the staff. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. So moved by Regent Williams-Brown and second by Regent Levy. Any discussion, any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay? Motion passes. We'll move to the next agenda item, proprietary school um, hearing results. Yes, thank you. So at the Proprietary Schools Advisory Commission meeting on May 10th, they also held the adjudicatory hearing. Um, this was to present evidence to see if the Louisiana Truck Driver and Vocational Career Center of Laplace, Louisiana, also doing business as CDL Louisiana, did allegedly violate three parts of the Louisiana Proprietary School Law. Background information about this school is that they were formally licensed from 2019 until 2021. They did not return in all their renewal application documents um, by the expiration date, and that is why their license did expire in 2021. <coughs> Staff were, was unaware that they had any students at that time, but in January of 2022, we were contacted by a student um, about their training and began the investigation into this uh, violations. At the meeting, uh, the commission was represented by myself. I gave testimony. Um, Chris Broadwater, commission member, was the cheering, chairing, the hearing chair, and uh, the school owner, Michael Dillon, was present as well. So the original charges were that the school did offer one unapproved program, that the school did not keep the required records, specifically the approved enrollment agreement, and that the school did not follow the required student refund policy. The commission heard evidence and also reviewed exhibits provided by the staff, and after that, they made the following findings that they present now to the board. The first finding was that they did not find that the school offered an unapproved program. They did find that the school failed to maintain a proper signed enrollment agreement, and they did find that the school failed to refund student tuition per the refund policy. As such, they recommend the following penalties to the board. They recommend a fine of $100 in relation to the violation of the student records. And they recommend restitution in the amount of $2,000 in relation to not following the student refund policy. And senior staff recommends that the board accept the recommendations of the commission, including the corrective actions. Courtney, do you want to comment on the current status of the program? So the school remains unlicensed at this point in time. They have um, started a new license application. Um, we will see if they continue with that new license application. But currently, they do not have any students enrolled to our knowledge? No, ma'am. This was their single student. And I think I would also add that um, our, our team here at the Board of Regents worked very hard to find another institution to help that student choose if she would she wanted to continue the schooling. They have found a place that will uh, that agreed to teach teach her out with all of her coursework. Thank you. Any additional questions? Am I am I allowed to ask, even though I'm not on the committee? Sure. Okay. Um, do they plan on refunding any of the students that the, they didn't refund? Before? The two thousand dollars would be the re restitution for the students. Okay. So that would go towards okay. the student. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we have a motion to accept the commission's finding? Motion by 
Regent Williams Brown. Second. Second by Regent Weil. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Is there any other business? No, ma'am. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Williams Brown and Regent McDonald. Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. 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 Motion nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we are going to jump right in since we've already had our lunch. And I'd like to call the June Board of Regents meeting to order. Members, remember, once again, we are still being streamed live. So uh, hit the, the push button and speak into the mic as we uh, move quickly towards uh, the end, even though we're only at the beginning of the Board of Regents meeting. So, so we will now move to call the roll. Please, uh, Ms. Doreen, uh, call the roll, please. Sure. Regent Davi. Regent Ewing, Regent Finley, Regent Levy, Here. Regent Lobre, Here. Regent May, Regent McDonald, Here. Regent Meir, Regent Perez, Regent, Regent Pryor, Regent Seal, Here. Regent Solomon, Here. Regent Sterling, Here. Regent Temple, Here. Regent Weil, Here. Regent Williams Brown. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is public comment. Do we have any public comments? Great. Um, uh, so any, you know, approval of minutes. Members, you received a copy of the April 27th, 2022 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Regent McDonald. Second. Regent Levy. Do I have, uh, you know, any discussion? All those in favor, aye. Uh, Opposed, aye. nay. Motion passes. Uh, a couple of chairs' comments. So um, it has been an incredible couple of weeks, you all. Um, I have a, the, the extreme blessing of being really close. And Miss uh, um, Meg Sundstrom does an absolutely amazing job of letting me know about every single thing that goes on. Uh, and asking for my engagement and involvement. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, just seeing all of these different things that I'll cover over the next few minutes, um, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. It's really great. And um, obviously higher education having a historic amount of money that we've received during this legislative session, but also the staff uh, and just the engagement um, of the staff with uh, our different universities. So first of all, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, the Title IX Symposium. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a great deal there. You see up in the upper right-hand corner, me getting the opportunity to introduce um, a keynote speaker at the event, uh, Kiki Baker Barnes. Uh, she actually is the first African-American female commissioner in the NAIA, the first African-American female commissioner in NAIA, originally from, uh, from here in Louisiana, right? Minden, not Monroe. North Minden, Louisiana. right? Minden is a is a suburb of Monroe, right? No. Uh, and That's so, a suburb of Homer. Of Homer? Which is a suburb of what? Ruston. 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 Wow, when well, you have a suburb of a suburb of Ruston. There you go. Right, right. We're talking about metropolis, right? Right. So uh, the participants also got a chance to hear from. Uh, from D.D. Bro, you see on the lower right-hand corner the LSU uh, legend on how Title IX helped level the athletic landscape. Uh, and then the day ended with an award ceremony, um, Title IX trailblazers from each system who tire tirelessly advance the policies. And just real quick on um, uh, Kiki Barnes, uh, uh, Baker Barnes, her – comments. Uh, they spoke directly to me. Um, obviously, my wife was a uh, college athlete and went on to play professionally uh, from a volleyball perspective. And then I'm uh, having an amazing time raising three daughters, uh, <laughs> two of which are already in athletics at a, at a relatively high level. Um, and just to see how she 
uh, talked about the the things that she learned as an athlete uh, and used athletics from her cheerleading all the way to uh, you know playing uh, college volleyball about uh, basketball. Excuse me. Um, it was just she did a phenomenal job and had a great uh, you know it was a great talk. Mr. Chairman, um, yes, sir. Did the girls get their athletic ability from after their, their mother. mother? From their mother, no, and people think I'm joking with that, but you know, my wife actually could dunk a volleyball in a ten foot goal. She's five ten, so she was an amazing athlete. I was a decent basketball player, so um, yeah, that's the difference in being an athlete and a and a and a, and a, and a specifically good at a sport. So HBCU Day, also, um, we had a phenomenal time out there. That guy in the middle uh, is um, uh, this is not on on here, but his name's John Gray. He's done an absolutely amazing job. He is my cousin. We have gotten our behinds whooped together, okay, literally. That is his son on his shoulders as uh, their team play. I mean, as the organization played, he, uh, he is an alumnus of uh, Southern University. The entire group that played was an alum were, were alumni of Southern University. Uh, but HBCU Day was on May 24th, jam-packed, burning up hot out there, too. Uh, <laughs> And so many kind words and recognitions, resolutions uh, for Southern University uh, outgoing President Ray Belton on his impending retirement, and also uh, Dillard University's Walter Kimbrough, who is also retiring, but unfortunately had to miss the HBCU day, but he had to miss it for a very, uh, very good reason. He was being sworn in as a member of the White House Bo uh, HBCU Advisory Board in Washington, D.C., so we, we, we can uh, consider that an excused absence. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we also, HBCU Advisory Council met with the governor's press, in the governor's press room and heard from the governor about the important role in their institutions play uh, in getting uh, to the 2030 goal. You see that on the lower left-hand corner. Uh, the council also received legislative updates from Louisiana's Black Caucus Chair um, Vincent Pierre, as well as advisory council members uh, uh, Gerald Boudreaux and Jason Hughes. Both of them did a phenomenal job in their comments. So uh, 150 legislators, stakeholders, guests joined in the backyard of the Pentagon barracks later that evening to celebrate HBCU student experience. Guys, there were plenty of great food. I ate twice uh, performances, <laughs> as I mentioned, by Southern's alumni band, the Gremlin Cheerleaders, and the Xavier Dance Team. Um, uh, and even though we were dealing with the muggy weather, it was still an absolutely amazing experience, guys. So big shout out to all the HBCUs and the region staff for absolutely having an amazing event, guys. Thank you so much for everything that the staff put into that. Um, and then, guys, uh, Gary Solomon, okay? Uh, just an absolute, I mean, guys, you know, we know what's going on worldwide. Sometimes we can get uh, insular in our focus, um, but this gentleman, um, you know, did something very, you know, and he didn't even know, I don't think that we were going to take it, you know, put, put him out there like this, but he uh, had a trip to the border of Ukraine where he assisted in feeding refugees fleeing the war, and, um, you know, he has a, actually has his Regents hat on. Y'all see that on the left, right? <laughs> um, and so, Regent Solomon, is there, you know, anything you just want to give us in terms of details about the experience? Uh we also did not plan for this. Either, right, I know, yeah. I know, I know, I uh, know. It was a really remarkable trip, um, and it made me super grateful to live where we live and to have the resources that we have and to have the ability as a board um, and as, uh, to have such an impact in our state. Um, what struck me, what was surprising about the trip, and I shared with a couple of our fellow regents at lunch who asked me about it, was there was a lot more, there were a far more, Ukrainian refugees going back into Ukraine than were leaving Ukraine when we were there. Uh, they were going back much in the way that we come back home after a hurricane when you don't quite know what you're going back to. You're advised it's really nothing to go back to. It's not safe to go back to, but you have that fatigue post hurricane to just get back home because in fact it's home. Um, we spent um, a little bit over a week uh, uh, preparing meals and feeding refugees, uh, mostly at this shelter that's pictured here that you can't see was a converted, um, it's outside of what was like a converted Walmart almost, right? It had been abandoned, turned into a temporary shelter for refugees located just a few minutes from the border. 
and throughout the day and throughout the night, buses would come from the border and unload people uh, who would um, stay here for one or two or three nights before they went back in, before they left, uh, before they continued on their journey, wherever they're going next, or vice versa. A lot of folks would come here, wait for their family members to meet them here, and then board a bus and head toward the border. Uh, the crossing at the border, getting back into Ukraine, uh, if you were in a car, would take about 23 hours or 10 miles to cross the border. Um, if you were going back in by train, it took about nine hours to cross the border. Um, and conversely, on the way out, it was not a whole lot of traffic coming out of Ukraine when we were there, as I mentioned. Um, overall, it was a really rewarding experience. Um, I had not unplugged uh, in the way that I unplugged uh, that, that week uh, for any time in my adult life as much as I did, and I was really glad that I got the chance to do it. Um, went with my fiance Seth uh, and our good friend Richard, um, and we had just a really exceptional time. And again, it made me super grateful for all that we have here and uh, got me charged to come back and do some good work in our own state. So thank you. For well, appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, obviously, once again, doing, doing work around the world, uh, whenever we can get opportunities to do that, guys, it makes a, a huge difference. And normally, uh, I would say, hopefully, for the right type of person, leaves them with a level of uh, appreciation that uh, of where we live and the difference that we're able to make, um, you know, ourselves. So, uh, also next, uh, the LCTCS presser, uh, which Philip May led, and they let me stand on the edge uh, there, as you see, uh, on June second. You all, uh, Commissioner Reed, uh, obviously was was there. Governor Edwards. Uh, Senate President Paige Cortez, House Speaker Clay Schneider, and of course the LCTCS President Monty Sullivan. Guys, Entergy donated $1 million over three years to LCTCS to help jumpstart the MJ Foster Promise Program. Um, and uh, you recall the Foster, uh, Foster Promise Program is tops for grown folks, <laughs> right? Right? And so uh, you know, the state's new adult financial aid program. So this donation, guys, will remove the financial barriers at, uh, that our adult students may sometimes face when they have to purchase lab equipment and other items uh, for their education and training not covered by scholarship dollars. So it's a great example of how industry can partner with higher education to ensure that we improve the student experience and grow a pool of qualified and skilled workers uh, our state desperately uh, needs to prosper and go to the next level. And so thank you, Entergy. Thank you, Regent May, for, for that donation. And uh, that uh, concludes my report. Thank you all. Next, uh, we are going to have a vote on all the committee reports and recommendations in my favorite terminology. Say it with me. In globo. So... <laughs> Uh, if it, unless any board member wishes to do it separately. Okay, all right, I'm not giving you any more time. All right, so uh, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve all committee recommendations from today's committee in Globo? So moved, yeah. All right, that was quick. Jay Seal, right? Uh, second by Regent David. Uh, any discussion, any questions? All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion passes. Next, we'll have our commissioner's report. Commissioner. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, members, uh, just cannot say how grateful I am for what a phenomenal board you are and the amazing work that you continue to do. It just makes it such a blessing for us each and every day to row in the same direction with a phenomenal board that's so committed to this work. Um, you have heard, the next slide, you have heard committee by committee saying best ever, best since 08, you know, top for the history books. And so I just cannot uh, stress how much we appreciate uh, the commitment that we have received and the support, obviously, that we've received in a team effort with all of higher education and our stakeholders uh, advocating for and talking about the importance of a reinvestment in higher education. Um, last year, we had a significant increase, I think best in 14 years. This year, best ever. Um, we'd like to top that uh, next year as well, but I know that you can't erase 10 years of the largest or the second largest disinvestment in higher education in two years, but we are trending positive. 
there's so much momentum and people are really uh, understanding the value and the importance of the work we do to develop talent. So I'm grateful for that. The next slide is just a, a few of the individuals who we have to thank. Obviously, uh, our governor has been committed to investing in higher education, talked about the importance of it when he ran for governor uh, and remains committed. The speaker and the Senate presidents were all about supporting the work and I certainly thank Regent David for coming uh, to Baton Rouge so that we could visit with uh, uh, Senator Cortez when our chair was uh, out of the country doing some of his work. And then I have to say something about Lieutenant Governor Nungesser. When we had a, a budget cut to faculty pay and talked to the governor about reinstating the faculty pay, uh, the governor said he would consider it. When he met with us, he said, we have reinstated the faculty pay. There were about $2 million that was unspent in the budget. There was a million dollars for a chiller for uh, Delgado, which was moved to state deferred maintenance. Um, but the lieutenant governor volunteered or committed to support a $5 million cut to his budget to support faculty pay for our budget. So I just want to say how important it is that we recognize the commitment across the state to something greater than any individual policy or politician. The value that we have, the transformative value that we know we have in trying to change lives in our state, improve lives in our state. So hats off to this team, to everyone who made calls and emails and talked. Uh, and advocated because this is a long time coming and a phenomenal um, result for the record books. Madam Commissioner, if I could just comment. I think for many of you who've been on this yeah, as a Board of Regents for many years, this is groundwork that you all have laid as well as I think it's the clarity of vision of the master plan that creates a clear vision, clear alignment, and I think that really stems from your leadership, Madam Commissioner. It's, I think it's hard work and long work for many of you and other members of regions who are no longer serving, but also I think the clarity of a plan can be unifying when there's alignment of purpose. So thank you to all of you who have served um, for many years and thank you, Madam, for your leadership. Thank you. Very happy to do this work, honored actually. Um, We've talked about not having enough teachers in our state. Uh, we are back in celebration mode after being shut down from the pandemic to celebrate future educators in Louisiana. Each of our public and private institutions were asked to nominate two phenomenal teacher candidates, and so we recognize them um, at the Old State Capitol. We had the Teacher of the Year, Annalise Tedesco, from St. Bernard um, in the white with the uh, flower and the First Lady uh, speak to uh, the individuals that we honored. It was a phenomenal event. You see at the bottom left, legislators came early before their committee meetings so that they could uh, recognize the honorees from their area. So I think it's great that we continue to lift the teaching profession um, and what a way to celebrate National Teacher Day uh, with the uh, future educators celebrating them and thanking them for their work. Uh, next, uh, I had a visit with uh, Dr. Craig to St. Helena uh, to um, see what's happening there. That St. Helena is the uh, school district that is most improved in the state of Louisiana. They have a phenomenal superintendent in Kel Kelly Joseph. Uh, so we visited all three of the schools, talked with students, walked the halls, visited with administrators, talked about pandemic, learning loss, technology, how do we support dual enrollment, all of it. Just a really great uh, opportunity to visit and learn more about what they call Saint, hashtag St. Saint Helena winning. St. Helena winning, yes. Uh, finally, I'm very happy to introduce David Spicer, who is sitting behind me. Uh, he is my governor's fellow, 10-week program. <laughs> So David uh, is from Sulphur, Louisiana, and he graduated high school. Yes, yes, uh, Willie Mount, yes. <laughs> he graduated uh, high school uh, with an associate degree from McNeese, uh, is a rising senior at MIT and the SGA president at MIT. Impressive, impressive. Uh, and so just very excited to have uh, David with us to say a few words.
Absolutely. As I'm sure you already know, it's been such a pleasure getting to work with Dr. Reed my three weeks. So I'm looking forward just the summer supporting the work of Regents. And certainly thank you for all that you do. Uh, certainly a newcomer at Regents. I can certainly see all the magic that you work. And so I'm grateful to sort of join the team for the summer. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Congratulations. Delighted to have you. So David thinks he's going to be a math teacher in East Baton Rouge, and then he's going to be a higher ed attorney and probably work at the Board of Regents. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Uh, finally, thank you all for the thoughts and prayers and the outreach to our former commissioner of higher education and uh, special uh, friend, Dr. Joe Savoy, the loss of his wife, um, Gail Savoy services are this afternoon uh, visitation and mass tomorrow. I did speak with TJ on yesterday to express our love and support to check in on him. As you know, uh, a 50 year journey with a spouse, it's very, very hard, um, one day at a time, um, but we're lifting up, him up in prayer and he is grateful to the Regents family for uh, thinking of him and continuing to support him in the weeks and months ahead. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, are there any other comments or business to come before this board? All right. No, any public comments? No. Okay. So hearing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Regent David, Regent Solomon, we are adjourned.